I, we're, we're, um, we're, we're reconvening to open session, um, and we'll start with um, actions taken in the, pa in the closed session. So Trustee Wh Rydell, were there any actions taken in closed session? There were none. One action? Okay, sorry about that. All right, um, the action taken six to zero. The board took action in closed session to, re to release a classified web administrator. Okay, thank you, Trustee Whit Riddell. Uh, right now, we're going to have an invocation led by myself, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Trustee Prendergast, um, followed by public comments. So first, we'll have the, the invocation. We all have our ballots in hand now. It's voting season. Considering this, I would like to share the words of a true giant in our great nation's history, Congress, Congressman and civil rights leader John Lewis. Many of my family members marched with him, and some died fighting for civil rights by his side. He wrote this essay shortly before he died, asking it to be published after he died. I want you to know that in the last days and hours of my life, you inspired me. You filled me with hope about the next chapter of the great American story when you used your power to make a difference in our society. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble. And he said that a lot, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process is key. The vote is the most powerful, nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. When historians pick up their pens to write about the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Amen. Please join me in saluting the flag of our nation. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And now we have, now we have public comments. And the first one I will call is Amina, yes, Amina Yassin, um, a professor at Saddleback College. Good evening, board members. My name is Amina Yassin, and I'm here to share with you some of, the la some of last year's events arranged and presented by the International Languages Department and the Liberal Arts Division, promoting diversity at Saddleback College. I would also like to invite you um, to attend our special events. President Milchaker, thank you so much for regularly attending and supporting us, and also for um, the uh, teaching you did on Passover a few oh, years thank ago. You. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, to begin in September, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month, we presented Chamber Theater Core Ensemble, Diego Rivera and, um, and Frida. We also hosted a teaching on Islam with uh, Professor Danny Dwayri. In October, we showed uh, movies, The Shape of Water, Even the Rain, the official story, and we also held an indigenous people celebration. In November, we hosted celebrations for El Dia de los Muertos, Diwali, and Hanukkah. In December, we held a teaching on the Baha'i faith and hosted Ariel Savage, whose organization fights for racial, racial justice and health equity for LGBTQ plus people. We also showed the movie, The White Ribbon. In February, we celebrated Black History Month with chamber theater and poetry. We also celebrated Lunar New Year. 
and screened the movie, the Spanish movie, Madres Paralelas. In March, we showed the movie The Lives of Others and celebrated the Persian New Year. In April, we held a Q&A with Barry Alexander Brown, followed by his movie, The Son of the South. We also showed Arrancame la Vida, and for the Day of Silence, um, we do that regularly, annually. We celebrated that, followed by the Chilean movie, A Fantastic Woman. We finished the year's events with our Eid al-Fitr celebration, marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. It would be an honor and a pleasure to see you all, all. At our, at our events next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much. And the next um, speaker we have is Pete Murray, Professor, professor Pete, Pete Murray, Professor at Saddleback College. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members of the board, Chancellor, thank you for your time. Uh, I'm Pete Murray. I'm a faculty member full-time at Saddleback College in Humanities and Philosophy. Uh, I come here this evening before you to express concern with what I perceive to be a pattern of problematic behaviors on the part of our president, Dr. Stern, and our vice president of instruction, uh, Tram, via sorry, Tram Kumamoto. Our president and VPI have been taking Saddleback College through a process of reorganization uh, this semester and this process is an instructive example of the pattern of behaviors that, I, that I'm referring to. Um, now, of course, the administration has the right to reorganize the college. That is not in dispute. Um, moreover, a, a thoughtful and well-planned reorganization has the potential to empower us as faculty, um, empower our staff, empower our administration. And there are certainly elements of the current plan that are, that are very commendable. Um, but what is of concern is how this plan has been developed and rolled out. Communication about the reorg from our administration has been unclear. Um, it's been filled with shifting justifications and sometimes straightforward contradictions. Just one brief concrete example. Um, Dr. Stern has repeatedly and publicly said that this reorganization is not about cost. Uh, when I challenged this claim in an email to Dr. Stern, uh, at the early part of this semester, arguing that any reorganization must surely be at least in part about cost, he said, and I'm, I'm quoting the email, nope, it wasn't about cost savings. Tram said it, I said it, the statement was truthful, is truthful. I expect it will cost me more to execute this vision down the road. But more recently, just this past week, when uh, our VPI had meetings with uh, the liberal arts chairs and then another meeting with the liberal arts division um, at these two meetings, she argued that the liberal arts division must be dissolved um, because the administration could not afford to pay for support staff for six schools or divisions, but they sorry, couldn't pay it, for five. It's, your two minutes has expired. Okay. Can you just sum up? Uh, yes, I just asked the board members to think about what you've heard today uh, and what you will hear and to bring a careful and critical eye on this process. And I'm, I would just like to ask for an administration that empowers us all to do our jobs better and to serve our community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then the next person is um, Kia Shafe, a faculty at Saddleback College. Good evening, board members, wonderful people here. Um, so I am a math faculty at Saddleback. And what I have to say sort of goes back, I guess, to what um, Pete was saying. I want to actually. Acknowledge some of the good work that Dr. Sun has done here. We appreciate that. My concern goes back to rework. Um, Dr. Sun was kind enough to send an email referring to the research was done in Colombia in 2013, I believe. I read that book. Reorg, pre-COVID, takes at least five years for us to do. Now we have COVID, AB705, AB1705. Faculty are tired. They are exhausted. The fundamental principle of reorg is implementation. Another fundamental principle is faculty, staff, admin working together. 
I just heard about this past Friday. Work has already started. Faculty had no input into this business. I urge the board for us to slow down, rethink what we're about to get in. If done properly, it could increase retention, graduation. We haven't, and that is in doubt. For every one college that succeeded, two have failed doing this reorg. My humble opinion, this is not a good time to start it. And if we are going to start it, maybe we should have been consulted first. Do you have any input to say with this? It's very tricky. So I just want to urge you to think about what good or bad can come of this. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great evening. OK, thank you for your comments. And now, um, Car Carmen Mara Hernandez Bravo, uh, full-time professor at Saddleback College. Good evening, board members and chancellor and student trustee, everyone here. I am going to read because I only have two minutes. Uh, I'm Carmen Mara Hernández Bravo, co-chair of the International Languages, co-chair of Equity and Diversity, advisor of the International Student Council. I am here today to represent the International Language and my colleagues. Many of you know I wear many hats. Today, I am wearing the Latinx hat. I am in this belief that with the new reorganization, having LA, liberal arts, and uh, uh, social science as one division, with one dean and one assistant dean, is not what the administration message is to the Latinx community when they talk about their success in education. Most Latinx population, especially first generation, uh, need the liberal art division that support them with reading, ESL, English writing, lab, etc. I am concerned that dissolving the LA division will mean that we don't serve this student well as we should. We are a Hispanic servant institution, and we should be advancing the Latin community, not thinking only about numbers, but how to better serve them. The merger of these two large divisions is clearly a disservice to this community and their future. Let us not forget that Latin Essex students, after succeeding in college, will make a profound difference, not only in their lives, but also in the life that they touch. We need to continue helping the Latin community as one division as the liberal art division. It is easy to talk about issues and support the Latin community. We need action and present. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much. And the next speaker is Margot Lovett. From, she's a professor of Saddleback College. That's the, la the last uh, speaker. Good evening, Chancellor Barnes and trustees. As you know, Saddleback has begun the process of reorganization. The aim is to provide and to promote student success by creating new schools that align with our guided pathways and by providing students with expanded support services. Faculty responses fall into one of four groups. The first group is opposed. They argue that there is no proof that reorg will help students. Some question the cost. But as you know, President Stern and VP Wathen are committed to protecting, not jeopardizing, the fiscal health of our college. The second group is not opposed to reorg, but disagrees with the process. The third group have questions about the specifics. Some were answered at two town halls. Vice President Vo Kumamoto and President Stern are addressing others in individual meetings with divisions and programs. The fourth group is excited by the possibilities of creating a truly innovative college structure. Integrating CTE and more purely transfer programs is one such innovation. Embedding student success coaches in each of the new schools is another. Coordinating service learning opportunities or opportunities for undergraduate research are others. 
Each one has been proven to increase student success rates. During the 25 years I have been at Saddleback, the college has been reorganized at least three times. This is the first time that the administration has included faculty in determining what that reorg will look like. Specifics do indeed need to be worked out, but I have faith in the ability of my faculty colleagues to work productively with the administration to do what is in the best interests of our students. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for all of your comments. Thank you for your comment. Um, um, right now, we're moving to reports. So right now, it's board reports. So Trustee Prendergrass, would you like to start with the board report? Sure. Um, <clears throat> So I'm sure everyone's going to touch on this a little bit that I'm was sure there, I'm but to be uh, you mean the, the game over the weekend? Yeah, the, the <laughs> Padres. I mean, oh my gosh. <laughs> sorry, the sorry, Dodger Dodgers fans. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, we had the unbelievable opportunity to meet a president of the United States. I, I, I mean, as a government teacher, uh, that was unbelievable for me, and then for me to be able to share that with my students this morning was was really, really nice. Um, and regardless of your party or politics, a president of the United States is the president of the United States, the leader of the free world. And it's just, it's a really powerful moment. And I really appreciate uh, IBC for putting all that together. Um, sorry, John, you weren't, you weren't able to make it. But it was, it was pretty cool. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, anyone who was involved in making that happen and letting us be a part of that because uh, it really was an, a unique opportunity, and that's really all I want to say because I'm sure others will say more. Okay. Thank uh, you. But thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Trustee Whitt Rydell. Well, I just want to dovetail that it was a phenomenal experience. I mean, he came right at us, and um, it was quite surprising how much time he gave to all of us. Um, I really, I would say that's equal or even better than um, his speech. It was good because he talked about prescriptions and their cost, but for the personality that I saw was quite different than what you see on television. Um, and thank you for the IVC. That was a heck of a lot of work. And I drove away thinking, my goodness, they're going to sleep good tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you very much. Um, I also attended with um, uh, the, ch the chancellor and the president and uh, Letitia. We went to the Orange County Business Council meeting, and I don't know why, if you guys can ever attend one of those, it's so interesting. It's the annual meeting where they give the, the summaries of all the different disciplines that we have, and those are where our students are going to go. And I found it very, very interesting, and Anne-Marie, you were there too, sorry. Um, it was very well done. Um, so I just wanted to express my appreciation to the council for putting that together and for inviting us. And thank you for getting us a table. That was very nice of you, Chancellor. Um, I think it's very nice that we are represented in, and now our Chancellor is our representative to the Orange County Business Council, so thank you. Um, for the sake of time, I will uh, move it on. Okay. Trustee <clears throat> Jamal. <laughs> yes, so we are going to adhere to two minutes, the board as yeah. well, uh, so we want to be consistent. I'm going to go even further uh, Trustee Prendergast, and thank John Hernandez. Because you weren't there, we had an extra front row seat. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> but you're getting more likes than I am on the on the post on the visit, so I don't know, you're more popular. Um, I, I, what I liked most about the visit of the president was that um, it recognized Irvine Valley College in the district. And I think when those of us who were there, you know, when you saw the teleprompter, which he did veer from, which was a little surprising, but he did on it two or three occasions, they mentioned, when he mentioned Irvine Valley College, I mean, the source of pride was significant. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone that had a hand in, in putting it together, David, I know there's a big team involved, Dan Oaks handled the media. So um, I think it was, you know, a powerful affirmation of the great district we have. Uh, and both colleges. This happened to be IVC, could have been Saddleback. And I think the reason it was IVC is because you have a very effective member of Congress, Katie Porter, who made it happen. For those of us who are there, and if you, it is on C-SPAN if you want to watch it, um, I think he spent about 25% of his time praising Katie Porter. 
Um, but I think she is the reason why it happened. Uh, so uh, kudos to her for making it happen. And Trustee Wood is right. I, I think I spent the most time with them. I wouldn't let his hand go. And I think the- We see the, that on yeah, film. <laughs> you can see it. Uh, you know, I could see the Secret Service sort of eyeing. Um, and, uh, but we got the photos, even though they said no photos, we got it done. I know a lot of people um, got uh, pictures with them. And I wanna thank Rick Miranda and uh, Chris McDonald for bailing me out and taking uh, the photographs. They've been, they've been great. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Hello. Okay, thanks. And Trustee Inman. And then you next. I'm green <laughs> <laughs> with jealousy. I had a family event that could not be changed, so I didn't get to go. So I made up stories about it in my head, just like I did when I was a little girl. I was sure that Dr. Jill Biden had said, honey, make sure you go to Irvine Valley College because it's the best one. You know, now the truth was it was, it's close to the airport. I mean, there's, <laughs> and it's flat and probably easier to secure than some places. But I, anyway, it's wonderful that that, that happened. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I wanted to talk about, too, was the Walk of Hope at Irvine Valley College, which I thought was just beautifully carried out. And um, I have known people well that have committed suicide and you know when that happens it's just you look back at the opportunities that you possibly missed um, would they have done any good who knows but you you have to wonder so one of them one of the saddest things was uh, you're not supposed to have favorite students but now that I don't teach anymore I can admit yeah you do anyway <laughs> she was a favorite student can't tell you her story now it's too long but she did commit suicide and I was very close to her and so you know um, we talked about academics we talked about where she was going to transfer to because I was honors director we talked about all sorts of things. We never talked about some of the most important ones. So I incur that brought that all back to me, and uh, we all have an opportunity because um, everybody's probably been affected at one time or another. So thank you very much. I'll try not to be green any longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Trustee Jay. Uh, I really enjoyed going up and, and seeing the President of the United States. I still can't get over it that we were there. and. It was such a sudden, it just happened so suddenly. We didn't know. At the, I went to the Walk of Hope and had lunch with the Chancellor and Carolyn and, uh, and, and, uh, <laughs> and the President of the Board. And nothing was said. And I could get, get home and I find out later in the evening about the President coming. I was in shock. And I also did the Walk of Hope mm -hmm. with them. But I wanted to talk. I know everybody was going to talk about uh, President Biden, but I wanted to talk about what I did on October 15th. I attended the open house for the new Advanced Technology and Applied Science Facility at Saddleback College. I visited the Advanced Manufacturing Electronic Tech and Technology and Graphic Design Laboratories. These and other labs were absolutely wonderful facilities aimed at teaching students the skills needed for them to be employed in mul multiple industries within our community. In many cases, the labs also show the local industries and employers what can be accomplished within the framework of modern technologies. Everyone involved in the planning and implementing this facility should be very proud of their achievement. I encourage faculty, staff, and the community, particularly those involved in technological efforts, to explore uh, with Saddleback College and the current potential benefits to industry and the community and these facilities. Now, it's time for the IVC Foundation's annual giving day. Join me in participating participating in the IVC Foundation's third annual Giving Day on Thursday, October 20th. This is a wonderful opportunity to invest in our students by making a contribution to a scholarship program or even the Foundation's unrestricted account. The best news is there's a very special and very uh, generous match. For every $2 you give, the IVC Foundation will match it with a dollar. There is, an, there is a maximum match of up to $500 per account. There is a limited pool of funds for the match, so give early and give often. 
If you're on campus during Giving Day, visit the IVC Foundation's office team outside the Student Services Building between 10 and 12.30. They are going to have special treats and giveaways since okay. it's the day of shake, shake, great shake out. Please come and shake out your wallet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Trustee Jay. Okay. Thank you so Stanley. much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I too, of course, um, met with the President of the United States, and I was thrilled that the President of the United States chose IVC to give his talk at. I mean, I just felt IVC is already on the map, and so is Saddleback College, but it really made it really on the map that the President of the United States, of all the community colleges in the United States, chose Irvine Valley College to, to give a speech at. And I even said that to him. I said, you know, you're at one of the top community colleges in the nation. And he said, well, his wife actually teaches at the best community college in the nation. So I said, well, we're second, and Saddleback College is third. OK, <laughs> we're, we're right up there. So, so we had a nice little exchange. He's, he's very engaging and nice and kind. So it was, it was really nice to meet him. And I've got the picture I took up with him that I sent to all my relatives all over the world, so, and they think I'm very important now. It's, it's just great. Okay. The, the few, few other things, oh, the, 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 one of the most exciting things about it was that our student dignitaries were there. The student trustee, the college, the student body presidents of both Saddleback College and Irvine Valley College, uh, they were all there, and I was thought, what a wonderful opportunity for our student leaders to be there meeting the President of the United States. I'll try to go quickly through everything else. I took a tour of ATEP with Senator Min. He was very excited about the public-private partnerships we're going to have, and we talked about it at, at length. The IBC Walk of Hope for Suicide Awareness was just very interesting. Um, I, I, went to, once, I went to the ATAS Open House also. It was so incredible to see so many professors and classified professionals there giving up their Saturday all day to be there, meeting with potential students and staff. There were about 400 people there, and they were very engaged talking about their, their own disciplines with the students. It was very, very great to see them all there. I'll just mention a few upcoming events. Homecoming this Saturday, October 22nd at 6. Um, informational meeting study abroad Costa Rica. There's, there's, there's opening sessions on Tuesday, October 18th, and Thursday, October 12th by Zoom, and I went on that study that, that study abroad class. I know my time is up, so that's it. But, but I did go on that study abroad class because I'm a biology professor and it's a biological study abroad class in Costa Rica. I paid full price. I recommend it, whole, I recommend it very much. Thank you. It's, it's excellent. Do you recommend everyone pay full price? I, I not only paid full price, but I paid more to get my own room. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> Madam President, I just wanted to share that we have our gala here at Saddleback College on November 5th. It's supposed to be an exceptional night. I hope that you all attend. Thank it's you. Here? No, well, oh. it's at Saddleback, and it will be at the Ritz Carlton as always. It's a very lovely event. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have um, the other organizations. So first, um, we have the student trustee Rachel, Rachel Abelos, who was. Wonderful to see to see her talking with the president. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, President Mo Chicker. Um, to update, uh, the California student trustees have a running group communication, and we met yesterday to give updates on our districts and just have conversations about basic needs in our district. And um, also to highlight, Undocumented Student Action Week is this week. And it was very timely because responding to recent legislation and to add on to President Hernandez's statement sent out that on behalf of SOC CCD student governments, we want to support DACA students in their rights to a fair education and health and safety. And we also support the rights of women and advocate for the lives taken in Iran due to a lack of support for this right. And. Um, it's also Transfer Student Week, and we also um, encourage students to utilize the great transfer center resources our district is commended for. And we are grateful also for the adoption of the inclusion of the letter A for accessibility in DEIA and how it is important to understand how that is implemented and how that will be structured and integrated in the classroom. And the student governments want to let students know that education, um, 
The student government wants our district to let students know that education is not only designed for students without disabilities as the default, but that every student has the right to a fair education. And on the student side, we are continuing DSPS advocacy through the initiatives in student organizations, such as Phi Theta Kappa, who dedicate their research to DSPS student rights and mental health advocacy, and supporting all faculty and staff in working together towards accessibility. And I was lucky in my five seconds with President Biden to mention making disability rights training mandatory in public college instruction because all students deserve the right to a fair education. Great, thank you. Good, good remarks, thank you. Thank you, student Chester Abelos. That's great, thank you. And um, now these Associated Student Government Reports. Um, are you uh, Angelica Bustos from IBC? All right, hello, um, hello everyone. So much like everybody here was just, I also had the amazing opportunity to go attend um, the event on Friday and was able to luckily like sneak in a shake like Biden's hand, which was really incredible. Never did I ever think in my entire life I would be in front of the United States president, especially growing up in such a small town, like just being able to have that opportunity was amazing. And also to be able to share with my fellow um, student government, uh, like uh, friends in there, they were also really excited the entire day. We were just extremely, um, just really happy. Um, also, uh, it was really nice to see, like also hear just to kind of echo what Trustee um, Avalos also mentioned, just um, Biden taking the moment to recognize uh, the situation that's happening in Iran and showing solidarity. It really meant a lot, especially to a lot of our students too that also um, have been just feeling just mixed emotions regarding this. So it was really nice that President Biden also acknowledged this too. Also, once again, just to echo uh, Trustee Avalos again um, with the Undocu Action Week, um, given the, also just current legislation, um, DACA, um, DACA recipients right now, and also just the process of just getting it renewed has just been really difficult. A lot of students are always kind of found themselves at a loss financially. So something that student government saw that we should do is create new scholarships for in our Office of Student Equity. We opened up eight new scholarships to have the opportunity of DACA students to be able to get an additional funds for um, to fund their education. Another thing is that election season is also coming on. So um, our student government, along with other organizations, are gonna be hosting um, voter registration booths on campus. Um, it's also midterm season um, at, on campus, so you can definitely tell that students are crammed in the library studying to make sure everything's like good with their finals. Um, also, we have the Halloween event that I would like to highlight on October 31st. Um, and that's um, something put on on the Office of Student Life. And we also have the Dia de los Muertos event that's gonna be happening November 2nd. Um, we decided to put these holidays separate because we wanted to recognize that Halloween is separate and also Dia de los Muertos separate. And that's a collaboration with several organizations like Dream Scholars, Puente, um, Latinx Student Association, and Student Life. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you so uh, much. You very humbly forgot to mention your interview with Telemundo. <laughs> No, yeah, I also had an interview with Telemundo, and I was, it was a short little clip, but definitely it was really exciting, and I was brushing up a bit on my Spanish to be able to give that interview. Yeah, fantastico, que okay, fantastico. <laughs> bueno. Okay, gracias. Um, uh, the Irvine Valley College Academic Senate, Dan DeRulay. Uh, good evening, President Milchiker, Chancellor Barnes, trustees, student trustee Avalos. Uh, the Academic Senate expresses thanks to the IVC's facility team, campus police, communications team, and administrators for their truly untiring work last week in preparing in record time for President Biden's visit. Uh, their work resulted in truly an amazing and memorable afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for that. Uh, I want to express a concern from uh, faculty tonight. We've had some mixed messages to Senate about the removal of the vaccination mandate, not surprisingly. Uh, for many of the comments we've heard so far, the comments have related especially to smaller laboratory classes, uh, where students and faculty are indeed in close contact for a significant number of hours, continuous hours. And concern has been expressed by faculty regarding students and faculty who are uh, immunocompromised and in those labs, and who also share homes with uh, immunocompromised individuals. So though I'm sure there may be, there, there may continue to be ways uh, to have this conversation despite the difficulties and continually changing COVID climate. And I do want to express uh, Senate's appreciation to all of you on the board 
uh, for your continuing to commit commitment to keeping students, staff, managers, administrators, and faculty safe and healthy. Uh, in closing, just two comments. Uh, first of all, thank you, Trustee Prendergast, for your personal, outspoken, and solemn support tonight of the San Diego Padres. <laughs> <laughs> And also, President Hernandez, I know you had to be away for the presidential visit, but I'm sure you'll be there for the next one. <laughs> good thought. Good thought. <laughs> great. Okay. Thank you so much. That was great. Saddleback College Academic Senate um, President Heidi Ochoa. Thank you, Trustee Marcia Milchiker, Tim, uh, Timothy Jamal, Terry Witt Riddell, Carolyn Inman, Barbara uh, J, TJ Prendergast, and Trustee Rachel Abalos. Thank you also to Chancellor Juliana Barnes. Thank you for serving this space that we all love and adore. I truly believe that if you find yourself at a board meeting, you probably <laughs> love your work deeply. Uh, Saddleback College executive team has spent many hours discussing reorg, but this has not distracted us from working on closing the loop on our equity goals. I wanted to give you a quick update on equity efforts emerging out of the labors of the Academic Senate executive team. First, I give you a follow-up on work that was initiated last year under uh, President Margot Lovett's uh, term. Members of the Academic Senate executive team have been working with administration to solidify the implementation of the Multicultural Center and the Director of Equity position. Last year, the Academic Senate Executive Team, in collaboration with our Equity and Inclusion Council and Equity and Diversity Committee, created a land acknowledgement. Since then, members of exec have been conducting research, scheduling presentations about land acknowledgements to inform our college community about what they are and their impact. They have also been working on having the land acknowledgement uh, incorporated within the plans for our Arbor Arboreum Trail. The Academic Senate Executive Team has also been working with the Art Department to expand public art across our college campus. In fact, we met earlier today. Second, I will now follow up on work that was initiated this year. As communicated at a board meeting at the beginning of this year, the Academic Senate Executive Team revised our equity focus goals to include specific objectives. We are already closing the loop on some of these objectives. A subgroup of the Academic Senate Executive Team has been formed to revise the DEIA interview questions for faculty. We are almost done combining and editing three lists that emerged from our Culturally Responsive Teaching Committee, the Urban Center of Education, and the District List of Questions. Once we complete this work, we are planning on revising the DEI recruiting list for faculty. Within our AS meetings, we have also worked to integrate DEI topics and planning. To achieve such, we transformed one of our VP positions into the Vice President of Equity and Inclusion. Efren Rangal currently serves this role. In his role, he serves as the Tri-Chair of the Equity and Inclusion Council, participates on equity-focused initiatives across the college, and reports back to the Academic Senate. I could go on. There's so many more equity efforts we are doing. But I just wanted to say that despite all the conversations that we are doing on reorg, that we are also moving forward on a lot of work that we promised we would set, uh, do at the beginning of the year. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. You. Interesting. Um, then Faculty Association, Melanie Hayari. Good evening. Good evening. The FA has no report this evening. Okay. okay. You can give your thank time you. to someone else if you want. Okay, thank you so yes. much. <laughs> okay, thank you. And then Irvine Valley College Classified Senate, Desiree Ortiz. Good evening, Good evening. President Milchucker, <laughs> Chancellor Barnes, trustees. As everyone, I was humbling, humbled and honored to represent our classified staff meeting the president. Trustee Inman, you were there in spirit because I think I took your seat because I was next to President <laughs> Milchaker and <laughs> Trustee Jay, so thank you. Um, we've been busy at IVC. Um, we hosted Chancellor Barnes at our last Classified Senate meeting. I hope we, we welcomed you with a warm IVC caring campus welcome. Yes, we had over 50 Senate members attain, mm -hmm. so they were truly grateful, so thank you so much. Um, we also attended our Latinx celebration where our classified completion team was asked to promote 
and show support for our first-gen students. And at that event, we actually um, promoted our first-gen event that we are going to be hosting November 8th, same as Saddleback. Um, so please come out and join us. It's actually a joint effort with our faculty, um, a lot of our student trustees, and just the whole campus in general. So we're very excited to be hosting that the second time. Um, also, we have been working really hard um, as far as our goals and DEIA, and we just added our VP of equity to our Senate. So we named Dr. Marcellus Reyes from our research team to fulfill that spot. Um, we know as classified members that we too have a duty to close our equity gaps in the work that we're doing. And we're super excited. And she now um, serves on the tri-chair um, President Hernandez's PAC DEI, so we're very excited about that. So we'll see you all in November. Thank you. Thank you so much. Interesting. So great, good, doing great work. Everyone is. Um, the, then the Saddleback College Classified Senate, um, Michelle McDougall Jackson. Good evening, trustees. Good evening, Chancellor Barnes. Um, I feel like I need to say ditto to my counterpart, um, <laughs> president here uh, at IVC, but uh, it was such an incredible honor uh, to have the opportunity to be present on Friday for President Biden's speech. Um, but much like our counterparts at IVC, we too will be hosting a first gen day on November 8th and 9th, which is Tuesday and Wednesday, I believe. Uh, this is Saddleback College's first ever celebration of first gen day. Um, and it will be hosted by the Classified Senate. We'll be um, getting t-shirts out to faculty, staff, and students who identify as first generation. Uh, we're gonna invite students to be a part of an interactive um, art installation where they can physically leave their mark on the campus community. And we will, are collecting interviews and testimonials of faculty and staff who are first generation that we plan to host on our website as in an effort to help students identify um, their support system on this campus, those who have gone before them as first gen students. Uh, we also will share resources and have um, a resource table set up for first generation students at the event. Uh, in addition to that, I'm very pleased to say that um, we are honing in on scheduling our Caring Campus kickoff meetings. So we too will join the ranks of uh, being a Caring Campus uh, with Classified Senate uh, organizing that charge. Um, and we too have updated our um, bylaws and um, positions on our executive team so that we will now have um, a vice president for equity and inclusion um, in addition to a vice president at large uh, so that we can help to close that gap um, on equity achievements and really hone in and focus Senate's mission statement, um, align it with uh, our, our equity mission. And that's all for me. Thank okay, you. Perfect. Okay, thanks so much. Good information. Um, then California School Employees Association, Scott Ferguson Green. Thank you, Madam President, Thank you. Dr. Barnes, trustees. I first wanted to personally thank Dr. John Hernandez, his entire team, everyone that was involved with preparing for the a visit of President Biden. I can't even begin to tell you how much I was honored by the invitation and how humbled I feel to be a part of such an amazing event. There are 340 million plus people in the United States. How many people can, out of all those numbers, can say that they had the opportunity of meeting the President of the United States? In my visit last year to Ohio, I've always been interested in the administrations of the president, and I got to uh, visit the birthplace of President Grant. I got to visit the presidential library of President Garfield, and also the hometown and area of President McKinley. Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would ever get the opportunity of meeting the president of the United States, and I'm very humbled to be a part of it. So thank you, Dr. Hernandez, and the entire team, everyone that was involved with that. Last night on NBC News, in between the football games, NBC News showed a clip of President Biden in support of the Persian people who support human rights 
and they mentioned about President Biden's remarks in that support. And in that clip, um, two people stood out in that crowd, and that was Dr. Um, Barnes and uh, Dr. Viscachill. So to me, if I saw them in a crowd, that means they're stars. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Okay, thank you. That's, that's great news. We have stars here. We really do. It's wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and, and next, are there any board requests for reports? Um, and then there's no public hearing. So now we have a resolution um, in recognition of Filipino uh, American History Month. So uh, Trustee Whit Rydell, can you read part of the resolution? Sure. This is only one resolution uh, this month, and it's the recognition of the Filipino American History Month in October. Be it resolved that the South Orange County Community College District Board of Trustees recognizes the celebration of Filipino American History Month as a testament to the advancement of Filipino Americans, a time to reflect on and remember the many notable contributions that the Filipino Americans have made to the United States. Be it further resolved that the Board of Trustees urges the people of the United States to observe Filipino American History Month with appropriate programs and activities. I will now motion that we accept Filipino American History Month. Can I have a second? So moved. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. So now the board members can vote on that. Trustee Whit Rydell made the motion and Trustee Prendergast made the second. Um, so the, the motion was uh, passed by six to zero uh, with a tr student trustee voting, uh, an advisory vote of yes. Um, and now we can move on. Thank you so much. And I've got four Filipino people in my family, so I thought that was great. <laughs> uh, next, we have 7.1, um, Board Policy Revision for Review and Study, um, number 7.1. So, so moved. Okay. Second. Yeah, OK. So trustee, um, uh, who made the second? Bobby. <laughs> OK, trustee OK, Jay. OK. Trustee Jamal made, made the motion. Trustee um, Jay seconded it. Um, oh, what? I have something to say. Okay, Trustee um, Prendergrass. <clears throat> um, I just want whoever decided to put a list of all of them in the main portion, thank you. <laughs> that is so helpful. I don't know why we haven't done it before, but whoever thought of it, kudos. Excellent. So are there any other comments? So now we can vote on it. Yeah, I think, I think the 2.5, was it the first one, 2110, is a new uh, or newly written one. I do think it captures the essence of the local decision making uh, well. So I'm sure the, everyone's had a chance to take a look at it. Yeah, it was, it was well written. And um, thank you to the um, subcommittee of the board to, that goes over all these. Um, so now we can vote on it. So the, the, the chancellor recommends that the board of trustees accepts for review and study the board policy, and it was passed six to zero with the student trustee advisory vote of yes. Thank you. And the next, so this is for review and study. The next one is um, the 7.2, the board policy revision for approval. So um, is there a motion and a second for this? So moved. Okay, Trustee Prendergast made most, and, and Trustee Inman seconded. Um, are there any comments? We already went over it last month, and this is for approval. Um, so now we can vote on it.
So it passed um, unanimously with uh, six to zero with the student trustee advisory vote of yes. Um, the next item is leg legislative and advocacy overview. So um, so Letitia Clark is chairing this. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, President Milchiker, honorable trustees. Uh, Letitia Clark, I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the District Office. It's my pleasure to tee up the uh, annual presentation that we have for legislative and um, the advocacy overview. Tonight with us we have in person Carol Gonzalez, who is a lobbyist and assistant um, consultant with Strategic Education Services, and she's based out of Sacramento. And we also have Dana Day Bamont, who um, is out of DC, and you all know well with Capital Advocacy Partners. So we'll start with the state presentation and then go into the federal presentation, and then there will be an opportunity for a Q&A right after. Thank you. Are they going to post it? Or OK. Thank you so much. Hi, good evening, uh, Trustee Barnes and the board and everyone here today. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, the firm has had the opportunity to represent South Orange County Community College for the past five years, I believe, since 2018. This is the first time that I've had the privilege to come down since then, and um, it's really an honor. I do want to share, though, that Strategic Education Services uh, is losing a, a pillar in our firm. Del Shimasaki will be retiring oh, really? by the end of this year and will continue the leadership uh, that he's, he's initiated. Uh, David Nebin will continue to lead the firm, and we will be supporting the district's priorities as we have in the past few years. Oh. We just wanted to be the first to let you know. Thank you. It's a big announcement. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, this year was really, really great. With big revenues came great success. We were, we had the opportunity to really strengthen our relationships this year with uh, our legislators and district representatives. Uh, just recently, I believe Senator Min had the opportunity to come visit the district, as well as having some of the trustees and, tr and Chancellor Barnes uh, meet with him in his office as well. And it's something that we look forward to uh, in the near future as well. This year, we also had a few capital outlay projects funded, which was really great to see with the extra revenue that came in. We also were able to really successfully influence legislation, including stopping AB 1505 and SB 22. Um, in addition, this year's budget allowed for a few uh, a few projects, including affordable housing planning grant, the Veterans Resource Center, uh, the Workforce Investment Opportunity Allocation, and really preserving the district's basic aid status. In addition, next year, this year, election is really transforming who represents the district and our leadership. By 2025, we will have over 49 new members. So there's gonna be a big change and shift in the legislature. And our hope is really just to continue to have a say and really influence members who represent us. That being said, by the end of this year, we will have at least four new representatives. So our goal is to really continue the work that South Orange Community College has done and really just continue the work moving forward. As for 2023-24 priorities, we really hope to continue to preserve the basic aid status, secure additional outlay funding, which Senator Min hopes to work with us uh, for a project. In addition, really just developing workforce pipeline, increasing dual enrollment and career pathways opportunities, which we've already initiated a few conversations with some members. And lastly, just really being the support for students, including uh, supporting financial aid and student housing, and just overall continuing the work that the district has done. And I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? 
So, so with, um, hi, thank you for that presentation. Of course. Um, with, uh, uh, many of us met with Dale, you know, frequently over the last few years. So what will this mean? I know you briefly touched on it in the beginning that David is going to continue leading the firm. I didn't know he was leading the firm. Um, oh. <laughs> so, um, it, what are, is it now that you're going to be, I'm sorry, what is your name again? No problem. Carol Gonzalez. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, I've, I've been also supporting the district for since 2018 as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but David and Dale have initially taken yeah. lead. And so as Dale steps, steps off by the end of the year, David will step in. Um, I see. But and you're going to be involved now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. And we'll be bringing someone on to support the work as well. Okay. So I look forward to future conversations. Okay. Yeah. Great. And also, uh, there was one other time we saw Senator Min, which was on Friday. He was Ooh. at the event on Friday. Wow. I think I've seen Senator Min more than I've seen my family the last two months. <laughs> happened. I just, in, I don't know. I just see a lot of Senator Min. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we need to uh, take advantage of this relationship we have. Yeah, definitely Sen agree. Just so you know, Senator Min was very excited. It was on a tour right. of ATEP. He's great. He's been he great. He was very excited about the tour of ATEP. Yeah. And um, he was very excited about having the various disciplines, like the Saddleback Colleges moving auto tech and uh, culinary arts. And he was really seeing it as, as a center. Interested. For, he, yeah, he was very interested in auto tech in particular, yeah. um, and electric vehicle servicing and technicians for electric vehicles. He was asking a lot of questions about it. Yeah, that's right. good to hear. So maybe want to give him a briefing. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, definitely. We need to keep him informed about it. So he, he was excited about it. Thank, thank you. Awesome. Are there any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you. We're sure you're going to get um, really good support from you in helping us get funding we need uh, from the state. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm getting a technology lesson here, <laughs> which everyone knows I need. Um, hi, I'm Dana de Beaumont from Capital Advocacy Partners, and my mind is a little blurred. I spent the day in Europe yesterday, oh. was home a few hours, and hopped on a plane to come here this morning. Wow. So happy to see you all and meet Chancellor Barnes and, and the rest of you. And let me just start with salt. Um, <laughs> that was salt. Okay. I, I was deadly committed. <laughs> I was. I really believed that salt was going to happen, but now, trusty Jamal, I'm not so sure. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let me go on to our presentation. I'm I'm wrong sometimes. Should have wagered on it. <laughs> I know you. I and I'm not a wagerer unless I really think I'm right. But I'm with Capital Advocacy Partners, and I took the long straw and got to come here to see you today. And I'm so impressed with all the construction going on. I've been here so many times, and I got lost trying to get here because there was so much going on. It, it was so impressive. Um, but we've worked with um, the district since 2013, and we have a full team of eight people. And I am a first-generation college student, and our firm is deeply, deeply committed to our associate scholars program, where we give paid internships to students, both remotely and in person. We have three associate scholars who are all paid $20 an hour um, to work with us. And we're, they're all from Southern California, and we'd love um, in the fall to have another scholar, uh, in the spring, another scholar from, from the district and from the colleges. So please keep those applications Thank coming. Um, these are um, the first photo is a group of students that came to DC, and we hosted the day. And um, Dante Moreno of our, our team really did an excellent job. Um, seeing them, and, and we are hoping that maybe some of them will feel like applying. Um, what we really do is, is we're your voice in DC, and we really work to build relationships, and we've had a lot of progress. The offices, including both senators, call us for opinions, and what you guys think are, are updates that we've sent have been used in the updates they send. So we've really made significant inroads um, for the district and its reputation. Um, and so um, we, we did a, a good number of meetings, I think about 10 this year. 
Um, besides all the regular updates we give, importantly, we worked with IVC to secure an Anna Peasy grant. We actually um, wrote it for almost $2 million this year, and we're really happy with that. We also have a community project that is $630,000 for both colleges to be sit, split for veterans. And there's also one pending in the um, FY23 appropriations for IVC for student basic needs for 337,000, which we're under a continuing resolution now until um, mid-December. And depending on what happens in the elections, will really say what's going to happen, whether we get a bill before the end of the year or whether we get a CR to February. Um, we, in legislation, we maintain a legislative tracking document that's significant. significant. The district, we help the district send 15 position letters, and um, we support um, 15 position letters and comment letters. We support grants. Um, including notification of funding opportunities, agency relationships, and um, special um, waiver applications to make sure we're eligible. Next year, as with the House, as with the State House, um, Congress is um, changing. Um, both the Senate and the House um, either could switch. I think conventional wisdom has the um, House switching. When I got into my hotel, I was shocked at all the ads for Michelle De Steele, for Katie Porter, for I, I, I hadn't, we aren't having that in, in the DC area right now. <laughs> um, so there are five retiring Senate members and, and um, um, who are um, Republicans and one Democrat, four are, are five are retiring Republicans and one's a Democrat. The House is more contentious, contentious um, and, and you're feeling it right here. Um, IVC is located in Katie Porter's district and um, will be picking up, um, Young Kim will be picking up if they win, if not their alternative. Um, and we have a chunk of Lou Correa and Mike Levin still. But Lou Correa is new, and it's good. We already have a really strong relationship with him. And in some of his comments in the committee, he's used um, our students as examples. Um, I touch base on the fiscal year 23 budget, um, where, where we are under a CR till mid-December. Um, it could be to February. Um, we have, we've been working on, on efforts with your um, legislative platform, Workforce for the 21st Century, Veterans, Student Support, Basic Needs, and DACA. Um, there's been a lawsuit filed for DACA, and we aren't overly optimistic. Um, they've said that the, they have to take another look at it. And um, there's been legislation in the Senate sitting for a, a year. I think we're going to be stalled for um, a little while. I don't think that's um, going to resolve quickly. Student loan forgiveness, the application is now live. Students can um, get up to $20,000 in loan forgiveness. It's one thing we want to make sure that our students that have loans are applying for forgiveness quickly. That's going to close by the end of the year. And um, <clears throat> it's something that's a, a real important um, thing for families. Um, other areas that we've worked on is HERF, rulemaking, the 90-10 rule, the Title IX, gainful employment, and student loans. <coughs> I have airplane breath. Um, um, we've already scheduled strategy meetings for each college. In, in November to work on um, appropriations requests. Um, and and um, some of the college known targets are DOL, Strengthening Community College, Hispanic Serving Institutions, NSF and STEM education. And Congress is also very interested in, in improved pathways between K-12 and, and the colleges. Um, Administration priorities, we're, we're very keenly focused on equity, community colleges, workforce training, CTE, and um, rollout of infrastructure and climate investments, which are pending.
um, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Trustee Jamal? How do you, know? <laughs> you just took your glasses oh. off. <laughs> You're telepathic. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dana. Uh, you know, we went right to the top on Friday. I know. I was very <laughs> impressive. Um, so is there anything we can do to build on this? Absolutely. We should definitely follow up. We should um, engage. We should know which kind of staff was with him. My good friend Anita Duns is senior advisor, and her and I have been texting back and forth since then. And um, we want to continue to build. And um, any information I can get about what transpired or any key conversations is super helpful. He said his wife, Jill, wasn't working that day, but she is a full-time community college professor, and he's, he's very proud of that. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's proud of it, too, as she should be. Yeah. So what do you think if the prognostications and the polling is accurate and that the Republicans uh, retake the House of Representatives? Um, let's just say, for example, the, Senate's, the Senate stays 50-50, which means the Democrats stay in control. Uh, what's going to happen to earmarks? Um, we call them um, community projects, not earmarks. <laughs> they changed the name. And, and they're, they're an opportunity for members to put in the high-priority community-supported projects. Um, we really don't know. I mean, the, the conventional wisdom is, is they could kick them out again. But, and, and, you know, Katie Porter already doesn't do them. Yeah. In in our so we work in in the Senate. Um, w there hasn't been a lot of talk about dropping them yet. Um, we'll we'll have to we'll have to see. I mean, we're going to know a lot in about two weeks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure hoping that they continue because we've been very successful at it. Um, you know, the district is is getting two projects two years in a row, which is pretty significant. Um, and but we can do grants if not, you know, it's it's not the end of the world, and we write very competitive grants, and the district has been very successful. Yeah, yeah, your your close to two million dollars and a PZ grant is on tonight's agenda for approval. So, yeah, for, for IVC, so that's great. Yeah, yeah, well, IVC you. did a great job, and yeah. and Brooke Bue oh. at the at the college really led that, and she's outstanding. Okay, Trustee Inman. First of all, I want to point out that that picture at the beginning includes our own student trustee mm -hmm. in this picture mm -hmm. as she was at that event. So she's uh, well educated to do her job this year. And then that's really all. I, I'm, it's a pleasure to meet you. I've been on the legislative Orange County Committee for yes. a couple of years now and, and uh, watched your presentations. So it's really... I appreciate everything that you do. No, it's our pleasure. We, we love the work we do on behalf of the college. We're deeply committed. Well, thank you, and thank you for flying all the way here from oh. Europe. Yeah, <laughs> just one other thing. Uh, just one other thing. We, we haven't, um, I don't think, did any of the trustees uh, go to D.C. last year for any so. visits? No. Nope. No, I mean, it's, yeah. you know, typically I think once a year, well, we didn't last Not year. Not for many number of years. I don't years. think it's been, for me, many yeah, it's been many years for me too. Yeah, yeah and what we've been doing to, to give the to still do the meetings, we've been doing the meetings virtually, and I have to say that not a lot of in person meetings have really came back in DC yet. Mm -hmm. it, it's really odd. Um, there are some, but but not as many as you would think. That people really want to do the virtual, the the staff and everyone. Maybe because it it's much more time efficient. I don't know, but we've kept that going. Um, but we'd love to host whoever wants to come to D.C. We've, we've got a growing team. Well, think about that. Think about that, absolutely. Okay, thank you so much. Trustees, thank you for your indulgence, and just thank, um, thank you to Carol and Dana again for flying down for the presentation. And I just want to publicly thank all the trustees for your commitment to meeting with a lot of our elected officials. You know, they want to meet with you. Uh, they like to hear from their peers, uh, also the students always, but um, it's so helpful when you reserve time um, and clear your calendars to meet with our electeds because it really does help in building those relationships. And as you can see, those partnerships and those relationships help us to 
get funding and, and support. So we appreciate that you you make time to do that year after year. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I do agree with you that elected officials like to talk with other elected officials and they really listen. So we've, we've been very successful in the past. So thank you. So um, thank you so much. Um, now the next item is the enrollment analysis presentation. Good evening and thank you, uh, President Melchiker, members of the board, student trustee, Chancellor Barnes, distinguished guests, and members of the public. I'm Dr. Martha McDonald, and I'm the Vice President for Student Services at Irvine Valley College. Good evening, my name is Nicola Perry. I am the Director of Strategic Enrollment Management and the Project Director for Saddleback's Hispanic Serving Institution Grant. In our time together this evening, we'll provide some context for the data trends we're seeing, review local data, discuss our collaborative efforts to retain and recover enrollments, and spotlight a few strategies unique to each college. And we're excited to share this information with you. National researchers have been discussing a pending enrollment cliff that's down from the peak enrollment period we remember from 2010-2011. As you can see on the chart, the decline for all undergraduate enrollment has been gradual until 2020, when nearly 1.3 million students disappeared from our colleges during the COVID-19 pandemic. Wow. This past spring nationally, enrollment dropped another 4.7%. Closer to home, we can see that the California community college system was also hit hard. As a state system, annual headcount dropped almost 20% since 2017. Local impacts to community college students mirrors what national research also shows. Our community college students were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and continue to struggle to regain full-time student status and even return to the classroom. While our district fared better than the state community college system, we are not without significant impacts to our headcount. This data was provided by our district research teams in collaboration with the directors of research across the county. This is the, through the first fall census, so it is preliminary for this date this semester but it illustrates that almost all colleges had the greatest reduction in headcount for fall 2021 with a smaller reduction for fall 2022. This data does include resident and non-resident headcount. But let's look at another measure, our FTES, or full-time equivalent student, and see how that was impacted. During today's presentation, we will use a variety of terms to describe what we're seeing today. For example, headcount is easy. Headcount means one student, one head. Uh, in the national data that was just recently presented uh, in the previous uh, slide, enrollment is used in place of headcount. So how many people are actually enrolled in a class or how many people are actually enrolled at a college? On the other hand, FTES is a count of the number of total full-time equivalent students, this is a calculation rather than a one-to-one -one ratio. For example, one student takes 15 units, that's one FTES. Five students take three units each, that's one FTES. For us, low FTES and high headcount could mean that more part-time students are enrolling in classes. This actually may impact how successful those students are in their educational goals, including graduation or transfer. Also, their time to completion and many other factors that may impact their success. Now, looking at our California Community College system, data that we received from the Chancellor's Office paints a very stark picture statewide regarding the uh, FTS impacts for the past five years. What began as a slow slide after the 2010 boom mentioned earlier by Nicola became an accelerated decline beginning in 2019-2020. In 
In the last five years alone, the state has lost over 20% FTS, going from 1.12 million to just a little bit over 900,000 FTS. So let's look at our local data and see what we're facing and how our colleges are set up to recover from the pandemic related issues. Like other colleges in our region, we had a large FTS loss during the 21-22 academic year, of course, due to the pandemic. If you recall, during summer 20, during fall 20, everything was closed, everything was shut down. And so while we had lower hand count, head count on the average, we actually saw that students took additional units, resulting in a lower drop in our FTES. But for 21-22, we battled things like Zoom fatigue, people returning to work, or students deciding to just wait it out and hoping that the pandemic impact would stabilize or be reduced. It is too early to report for the full um, impact of fall 2022 numbers. However, our preliminary, preliminary data is, share, is showing us that across the district, uh, we are within one to 2% of last year's numbers for both FTES and headcount at this point in time. And what we're expecting is, we're expecting to actually see a climb as we, as we begin our second eight week courses. But let's look further down the road. Primary and middle school enrollments are also declining on top of what experts are calling the baby bust, the declining birth rates caused by the COVID pandemic. This is our pipeline. And when we view our state and county data for high school graduates projected through 2031, we see a much greater impact locally for declining traditional age college students. <coughs> While we follow the same general trend line, we are ultimately projected to have almost 18% fewer high school graduates in our county by 2030-31. With local competition further north in our county, IVC and Saddleback must continue to find ways to differentiate ourselves and be the colleges of choice for our community members and their families. There has been a lot of talk nationally about serving the adult learner or the non-traditional student. We see that same pattern here when identifying emerging or growing markets. And this is one way we can continue to differentiate our colleges and our programs. As you can see, the only age group under 50, that's not us, <laughs> the only age group under 50 that expects to see a population increase through 2025 is the 25 to 29 year old, the adult learner, the non-traditional student. When we think about that student compared to our traditional right out of high school student, services and instruction shift to meet that student where they are. This student may be more likely to attend part-time, be raising a family while also going to school, and may want to take several eight-week courses instead of a full-term semester. So what are some of the other factors that we need to consider? We also have other factors to consider, such as perceived value of education, competing strong labor market. These are just local, lo local factors. Community colleges across the nation are having these very similar conversations. If we were to conduct a SWOT analysis right now, we would identify these as our strengths, our threats, and our weaknesses. So helping our communities understand why college now and why college, period, may help dispel some of the fallacies around attending community college. And while we're an open access institution, we aren't accessible to all uh, to all, and still have a lot of work to do in terms of demystifying how to go to college and why it matters. Challenges around affordable local housing, transportation, childcare may keep our many of our may keep many of our traditional or or adult learners on the sidelines. Another opportunity we see nationally and locally is the request for alternative class format formats. 
So for example, eight week course length, course, course lengths. This would allow students to take one or two classes at a time and still end with 20 units per term, keeping them on track to completion while still keeping their schedule manageable. Retention and persistence are continued enrollments. And staying on the path and persisting through to the next semester means each student is closer to accomplishing their goal of certificate, degree, or transfer. The colleges together have made significant strides to positively impact student retention and persistence, areas where other colleges can lose up to 50% of their students from year to year. One shared example we'd like to highlight is a program that we knew would take so much work and collaboration, its code name was Everest. Mm -hmm. For the past year, district IT and teams from both colleges changed business processes to implement two significant payment options for students who were unable to pay at the time they register for classes. The first was what we nicknamed Base Camp One, what you know as the pay later button. When students register for classes now, they can let the college know that they will pay later, either with financial aid or with another method. And that extra time to pay matters. What was once five days is now 16 days. And this gives the students the chance to register for the classes they need during their priority registration appointment, while also giving them up to three weeks to pay without losing their classes. In the second semester that the pay later button was in place, almost 30% of Saddleback's credit students use this tool. And over 81% of those students were able to find a way to pay for their classes within the 16 days. In prior semesters, the percent of students who were registered and were able to pay within five days was 55%. IVC students enjoyed the same successes. 87.5% of all students from IVC who selected pay later were able to find a way to pay for their classes within that same time slot, compared to 64% from before. So what we nicknamed Everest was our third party payment plan. This was recently implemented across the district and we expect this solution to help those students who need more than 16 days. These students can select this option at the end of their registration and work directly with Nelnet to spread out their costs throughout the semester. Changes like these are much more equitable and increase access for students who otherwise may have felt left on the sidelines. So as we move beyond the next uh, year or two, we need to continue to think strategically about how we make our institution hubs. Hubs for equitable change that best serve our students and our communities. Addressing the enrollment challenge must start with intention, intentionally organizing our institutions to equitably serve the students in our communities. We must shift our focus from helping students become college ready to making our colleges student ready. And to stop further backsliding, we will need to recruit and retain the very students we've historically struggled to attract, including students from low income and underrepresented groups. Understanding how we can adapt our portfolios and programs to better serve these students, while also remaining true to our college identities, is what our colleges are working on. We are going to take a few uh, minute, uh, we're gonna take a minute to highlight a few examples of the type of work uh, and what we're doing. At IVC, we have two strategies that we'd like to share with you. The first one is a debt relief program, which removed financial barriers from, um, in order for students to be able to continue their enrollment. The second one is the completion project. Um, this is direct outreach to students who are very close to degree attainment. However, they've stopped out and they don't realize that maybe they have just one, two, three courses to finish to uh, attain their either their certificate or their degree. So from the onset of the emergency closure in spring 2020, IVC has been able to assist over 1,600 students uh, with debt-related relief in terms of past enrollment fees. Uh, 
Financial barriers in the amount of almost a quarter of a million dollars were removed for these 1,600 students so that continued enrollment would be, un one, would be uninhibited and that these students could then persist from semester to semester. The debt relief program, which IVC plans to continue employing, is directly and positively impacting our students in their ability to continue their educational goals. The second strategy is, as we know, um, statewide, there are 6.8 million adults with some college but no degree. This is what we wanted to address. Our college understands that although enrollment is important, the end goal is to help students obtain their degree and find employment. With that in mind, we focused our efforts this fall on directing students to enroll in courses that are missing from their um, degree or their certificate. Our approach re revolves around uh, the removal of barriers. The first one was uh, to inform the students of the courses that they are actually missing. And the second was to use her funds to pay for the courses, materials, gas, anything, any type of barrier that the student was um, facing in order to complete these courses. Our intervention is 40% effective at re-engaging students that have left and has been highly effective in increasing the number of students who are completing. Moreover, this is especially helping our students of color attain their educational goals. Given this preliminary evidence for its effectiveness, we anticipate sharing our findings with the broader system as a best practice around enrollment, management, and student success. And for Saddleback, I'd like to highlight our REACH Collaborative and our HELP classes. Our state community college system is one of six across the country to join the REACH Collaborative, which aims to increase attainment of high value non-degree credentials and associate degrees for adult learners of color. By joining the Collaborative, Saddleback can be innovative and intentional with a small grant to develop specific on-ramps in two or three pathways that are tailored to support the non-traditional students we've been talking about. Our counseling, health sciences, business and extended learning divisions are working on these models now and have until the end of spring 2023 to finish building these pathways and their on-ramps. The second strategy I'd like to highlight is focused on course completion, which is key to student retention and persistence and it's our HELP initiative. Over 30% of Saddleback's credit students enroll in and fail one of these HELP or high enrollment, low pass classes. These classes are key to the student's progression and are usually milestone classes in their programs. Institutional research and faculty leadership are working together to develop informed and measurable impacts that we hope will eliminate our HELP classes. Looking ahead, if the last few years have taught us anything, it's that every plan A needs a plan B and C. <laughs> we will continue to monitor, evaluate, and respond to enrollment patterns locally and across the state. We will continue to collaborate and realize the benefits of scale when it can help, and then support each other when we can differentiate our services without negatively impacting our students, all while remaining committed to applying an equity-first lens to our work. This work will take our classified professionals, our counseling and instructional faculty, our managers, and the support of the chancellor and our board of trustees. The colleges are ready to address and close the opportunity gaps that we made even more apparent as a result of the pandemic. Through innovative and in intentional programming, supports and instruction, such as those outlined in the Student Equity Plan, the ECA Plan, and all of our strategic plans, we are looking towards emerging as a statewide leader in equitable student success. This slide, uh, what we have here is we've linked several resources that had helped inform this presentation today. In addition to that, we would like to take this opportunity to thank our institutional research teams at our respective colleges, as well as the district for helping us put this data together.
Thank you, and we're ready to answer any of your okay, questions. Th thank you so much. Um, are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Yes, Trustee Jamal. Wonderful. Uh, nice presentation, both of you. Thank you. Um, where do you put the, by the way, I think in the enrollment challenge or problem is the challenge of our time. I mean, I think this is, um, this is the seminal issue for the district, uh, I believe, and I mean, it affects everything, uh, including reorganization, which was brought up earlier. Um, where do you put, you mentioned competitors, I know we, our other community college districts, we um, view as competitors. Where do you where do you view the for profit colleges and how as enrollment how have enrollments affected them the last two to three years? Yeah, it's my understanding that uh, of course the the enrollment has enrollment decline has impacted colleges ac across the nation, uh, especially private schools um, because of, of the cost. Um, so from what I've read and from what I understand, it's impacted them at a higher level. So I, I guess when, when I came on the board, um, which was about 10 years ago, I think the issue of for-profit colleges came up a lot, it seemed to come up more often, and that we, there, we had opportunities to get students to come to community college who otherwise would go to um, a for-profit college and pay you know, 10 times the tuition. So I guess, um, do we feel that's not an opportunity now? Or uh, maybe uh, I see a hand up, uh, Dr. Stern. If I can jump in on that one. Um, so enrollment for the privates has gone down considerably in the pandemic and prior to the pandemic. Um, I think it goes to value proposition. And I think that affords us an opportunity to establish our value proposition vis-a-vis -vis not only the private predatory colleges, but also our competitors in the UCs and CSUs in 2 plus 2 arrangements. I will say this, though. I think the privates have taught us a lot of things, and I think we've learned a lot about that during the pandemic. For instance, they were better at online than we are, and now we've caught up, and we're doing pretty well at online. They were better at getting out in front of students with enrollment coaches and success coaches to make sure that a student who once made an inquiry became a student and stayed a student. We've jumped on board. We're hiring enrollment coaches and success coaches. So I think we're better positioned to compete with them, and I think we've learned a lot from some of their better practices um, by adopting some of those ourselves. Okay, good. Did you want to say something, John? No. Okay. Not on that account. And, and then my, my other question um, was, talk about the labor market today because that's another challenge. I know as an employer, I'm an employer in my own business and private life, it's really, it's immensely challenging to find people. Um, so how, how do you view, you wrote strong labor market, tight labor market. How, how do you view the labor market today? Uh, so... We are competing uh, with a labor market that is willing to attract those employees that, that you're trying to attract as well in your own business. Uh, we're competing with companies like in and out who are paying over the minimum wage, who are offering um, benefits, who are offering uh, bonuses to sign up. And a lot of our uh, students, especially those with families and those right out of high school who see that as an opportunity for now and not as a long-term opportunity. And so those are some of the economic issues that we are currently uh, being challenged with, as well as the pandemic, um, you know, also I think shifted, shifted uh, values for people in terms of what was a priority back then may not be a priority now. So... On top of having that enrollment cliff that we, we were sort of getting, bracing ourselves for in 2025, the pandemic just really created a huge impact, you know, on top of that mountain. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Prendergast? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, kind of segueing from that, uh, though I wasn't able to make the Orange County Business Council event, they did send us the report, and I looked through that. Just wondering how much, like, do you guys get access to that? Does it drive any of your decision making or uh, consideration? Thanks for that. 
Um, we do get, I, I was in attendance, and we do uh, read that and other regional economic reports. Um, that report uh, alludes to a very tight labor market, as Trustee Jamal uh, mentioned, um, and that market pulls away would-be students from us. So when we see projections of a continuing tight labor market, as the report suggests, um, it means that the recession that might be a saving grace for many community college students may not be coming anytime soon, and if it does, it may be more gentle than people expect. Um, so we do pay attention to that. Our enrollment, uh, Trustee Prendergast, as you know, is counter-cyclical. We tend to go the other way uh, relative to the economy as a whole. So we are in a booming economy right now, um, so our enrollment is going down. The trick for us is how do we not just get through that, but how do we find ways of competing with that labor market to hold on to students? Um, so for instance, if minimum wage, practically speaking, isn't really $20, but now $22, um, how do we compete with a $22 job when we don't offer a $22 job at the end of that credential? That's gonna be hard for us. But one of the ways we're doing that is by looking at more work-based learning opportunities. So if the employer is trying to pull away our students in the labor market, how do we actually collaborate with the employer to create work-based learning opportunities where the student can do some learning on the job and some of the didactic learning in our classroom. That's really a big part of our future and how we will tie ourselves to those future economic conditions and weather them out. I'm feeling very optimistic with the unique opportunities that we have, particularly with adult learners. At IVC, about 54% of our service area uh, residents are working age adults. And to me, that presents an opportunity for retraining, recertification, short-term industry-driven certificates, and opportunities to really prepare individuals for the workforce. Joining with industry in helping to prepare and to respond, I think, is a, another unique opportunity. Um, today, you have under the instruction um, docket a new certificate for IVC. It's our first non-credit short-term certificate of competency and it's one of several that faculty are working on developing. And I'm really um, encouraged by that. And I, I know, for example, the faculty in our computer information systems program have mapped out some future career achievement. These are typically three courses to get a certificate. Um, they're, they're planning to map out in things like cybersecurity, cloud technology, data analytics, web development, and so forth. And our adult ESL program has, for the first time in our uh, adult ed program, expanded beyond English language acquisition and are starting to do vocational specific English for specific uses. Wow. And we have the first three classes that were offered this fall with um, um, just uh, overwhelming demand for enrollment. So I do think that the, it, it, I see it as uh, investing in our portfolios, our financial portfolios. We can't put everything in that traditional K-12. And so expanding and finding the pockets of opportunity where we can leverage and truly serve all of our community members, because not every single student at our colleges aims to transfer and, and obtain a baccalaureate degree. Um, and so I, I think we're being very mindful of those opportunities, those needs, and working with our faculty um, who are responding to that um, challenge and, um, and, and really are, are starting. I, I, it's exciting for me to see conversations with faculty to create those on-ramps from non-credit short-term CTE to credit and other opportunities. That's interesting because I attended the Pathways Conference in Seattle. I, I want to say it was October of 16, so a while ago, mm -hmm. and we got a presentation on an organization in Texas that was doing EMT training and included uh, English vocabulary word acquisition as part of that certificate of completion. And it's just shocking to me that we're just now getting there six years later, but it's good that we're getting there. Yeah. Yeah. So keep up that good work. Thank you. Uh, and I just wanted to know if we had any explanation. It looked like there was an anomaly there for Santa Ana's enrollment going up. I'm curious what they did to make that happen. Go ahead. <laughs> we, uh, well, it's just all rumor, so I don't want to say anything s specific on the record. Um, but it, it may have been some errors in calculation, not on our part. 
<laughs> okay. And I, I, I believe possibly part of their enrollment growth has been in their non-credit. And uh, Rancho District really has the monopoly on non-credit adult ed for both the Orange and the Santa Ana uh, Unified School Districts. Those school districts got out of that business years ago. And so again, adult learners, non-credit adult ed is something that um, I think I'll speak for IBC that that is an, an area of priority for for us. Yeah. And frankly, the, the 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 county is large enough that you know there's significant members in our own service area that that could benefit from that type of instruction. And so, I don't even see it as direct competition, except perhaps for like the Tustin Santa Ana area, because right now they're the only game in town, and I want to make sure we are as well. Any other board member? Thank you. It's, it's actually very exciting because, um, you know, to find our own niche in, in, in this uh, changing population and the changing demographic and the changing mood of the country, everything changed during the pandemic. I was, there's a, a book that came out about it recently and um, talked about how it just changed so much in, in, in our country and in the world. So, so, um, so we're dealing with it, which is exciting. It's very exciting. We're finding our niche and we're taking some some ideas from proprietary schools, having short term classes, and working students like that. It's a great idea, I think. So, um, okay, thank you so much. So, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Very very exciting, actually. Um, the next item is the consent calendar. So are there any items any board member would like to remove from the consent calendar? No? Okay, seeing none, <laughs> do, I, do I have a, a motion and a second for approving the whole consent calendar? So, so moved. moved. Oh. Okay, so uh, Trustee Jay makes the motion and Trustee Edmund seconds it. And now... Um, <laughs> yeah, let's do the roll call because there's some, some technical difficulties. Okay. <laughs> We're doing a roll call because there's some te technical difficulties. Trustee Inman? Aye. Trustee Jay? Aye. Trustee Jamal? Aye. Trustee Melchiker? Aye. Trustee Prandergast? Aye. Trustee Whit Rydell? Aye. Okay, thank you. So th the uh, item passed unanimously with a, um, with a vote yes from the student trustee an advisory vote, yes. Okay, now um, the next one is uh, the IVC. We're talking about that Anna Pizzi grant we talked about earlier. That's about a $2 million grant. So um, is there a motion and a second for this? A second. Okay, so, so Trustee Inman makes the motion and Trustee Jay seconds it. Now we can vote on it. Are there any questions or comments? This is a, this is a very significant grant, $2 million for Irvine Valley College Anna Pizzi. Oh, can we, do we need a roll call again now? What? You can vote online. We're voting online now. Okay, great. What do I do now? What do I do? It, ha it hasn't come up yet, so there it goes. Oh, there it goes. Okay, the motion by Trustee Inman, second by Trustee Jay, and it passes six to zero um, with, a, uh, with a yes vote um, by the student trustee. So the next item is um, a grant acceptance um, from the Department of Education for saving veterans with intervention pilot program. Are there any comments or questions? So moved. Okay, so, okay, Trustee. Second. Okay, Trustee Jamal makes the motion and Trustee Jay seconds it. <laughs> and the, the motion passed um, six, six to zero with the student trustee advisory vote in favor of it. The next item is uh, Saddleback College Community Education 
um, services master agreement with the Capo Unified School District. So is there a motion second? I okay, Trustee Inman makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. So, uh, Trustee Jay seconds it. Trustee Inman, do you have a question or a comment? Yes, I'm very interested in how we coordinate work with other age groups, for other age groups from other places like elementary or, you know, that kind of thing. So I wondered, I had two things. I wondered uh, what exactly are these programs about? Uh, just in a general sense, what, what are they going to do? And secondly, I know a, a long time ago there were um, a lot of younger students that came on campus. Uh, we did that at IBC uh, decades ago. <laughs> uh, do we have programs where the kids come here to take classes? I'm going to take a first crack at uh, your questions while I ask Vice President Vo Kumamoto to head toward the podium in case <laughs> there's any I can't answer. Um, so yes, students will be returning to our campus as part of this program. We're very glad for that. We think part of the enrichment that is a, that mm -hmm. what these programs is about is also about social engagement and social enrichment for them. Um, the programs focus on middle schoolers. Um, primarily, we have other community ed programs that focus on different types of students. And in terms of the programs, typical programs would be um, music programs, mm -hmm. uh, coding programs. Um, so in general, it's the sort of thing that districts can't afford to do mm -hmm. in before and after school programs that they used to do. Um, but through grants and additional assistance, they've been able to hire us as a vendor to essentially deliver and coordinate these programs. Vice President Vokumoto, anything to add? Yeah, I'd like to add that this particular um, contract that we're going into with Capital Unified is to support students who couldn't afford to attend our camps in the past and or couldn't afford to do mm -hmm. our before and after school programming, both at the um, K-12 sites as well as here on campus. So we're really excited that we're going to be able to um, support a new demographic of students um, that in the past were not able to attend um, all of our programming from you know, the elementary school, college for kids, um, as well as the before and after school programs. Uh, it's a special grant that the K-12s got, and then yeah. they were contracting out with us. Then one um, follow-up, is there a transportation component to it? They have to get from their school, let's say, to here? Yes. Um, yeah, we're working on that with the, the K-12. OK. Yes. If your mother's at work, you <laughs> Yes, you that's out. always a critical piece. Um, during the school year, we do try and do the programming at the school site. Uh, but mm, during the summer, we're sense. looking at the transportation to get them here so that they can be exposed to our campus. Oh, right. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we can vote on it now? So the, um, it, it was passed six to zero with the student trustee advisory vote of yes. The next item is um, the uh, district-wide construction management services, and um, it, it increases the contract amount by $500,000 for a new amount of close to a million dollars. Well, no, $9 million, sorry. <laughs> $9,361,000. So um, do I have a motion second? So moved. Trustee Pendergast makes the motion, and Trustee Whitwaydell seconds it. Now, now, any questions? Now we can vote on it. Oh, it passes unanimously, um, six to zero, with the student advisory vote of yes. Uh, the next item is in human resources. 
So it's um, the academic employees section. So uh, Vice Chancellor Viscachill, are there any changes? No changes. No thanks. changes. So is there a motion and a second? No motion. So moved. Trustee Jay makes the motion. Second. And Trustee Prendergast has seconds it. And um, are there any questions? Okay, now, now we can vote on it. Just came up. Yep. No, mine didn't come up. There. Okay. Because <laughs> I already voted. Um, it, it's uh, unanimous, six to zero, with a student trustee advisory vote of yes. Um, and the next one is um, under human resources. Is the sabbatical leave rec rescindant for it's person classified personal no, items? Oh, the classified personal items is next. Okay. So, are there any changes? No changes. Thank okay, you. thank you. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Trustee Jay makes the motion. Is there a second? So moved. Then Trustee Whitwright-Dell seconds it. Now we can vote on it. This is a classified. Okay, thank you. And um, Trustee yeah. Jay? Oh, I just wanted to thank, uh, it was Ted Miller who worked for 35 years in one month, retiring, and also our appreciation to Amy Hunter for what she's done. She's been wonderful, and she's retiring. <laughs> I know. Thank you. I was going to make the comment. I'm glad you made it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, these it's, she's she's was classified um, Senate president for a number of years, and she worked very hard on a number of other projects at Irvine Valley College. Yeah, she's Thank you. And the, the next item is the um, one the, one of the faculty members is rescinding uh, the approval of her sabbatical leave for spring twenty twenty three. So, do I have a se motion and a second? So moved. Trustee Jay makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. And Trustee Inman seconds it. Now we can vote on it. Okay, the Board of Trustees approved the sabbatical projects of 20 faculty members. Uh, and this one, for personal reasons, can't, can't, can't take a sabbatical. The motion, the, the, the item was approved six to zero, and it passed with the student trustee vote of yes. Um, and the next one is sabbatical. This is tenure track hiring author, authorization, number 11.4. So do I have a motion and a second? I so move. Trustee Inman makes the motion. Second. And Trustee Prendergast seconds it. Are there any questions? It's interesting to see that hopefully we can hire all these faculty members for, for next year. That'll be great. So um, can, can, you can vote now. Oh, the, this item passed unanimously with the student trustee advisory vote of yes. Um, the next item is 12.1 um, enterprise resource planning system. Is that you? <laughs> okay, <laughs> would you like to say something? <laughs> um, um, Dr. Chris McDonald, the vice chancellor, will, will be speaking on this. <laughs> um, I'll just be brief. Um, 
we are finalizing um, the contract review process. And uh, the board and the community is well aware that we have done an evaluation and we're moving away from Workday and the homegrown student information system uh, to Banner. So the item um, on the agenda tonight is a request for the board to give us the authorization to proceed. Okay, thank you so, so much. So moved. A second. Okay, so Trustee Prendergast makes the motion. Trustee Whitwright-Dell seconds it. And this is a big move for us, so this is very exciting. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> no, no, it's very exciting. Now we can vote on it. So it passed unanimously with the student trustee advisory vote of yes. So we'll be moving forward to a whole new system. So exciting. Thank you. Um, and then the next ones are just informational items. Uh, for instance, staff response to public comments, uh, uh, Saddleback College, Irvine Valley College speakers. Looks like there's some good speakers. Monthly financial status reports, um, her funding, um, SOCCC basic aid report, retiree or OPEB trust funding, and then re um, comments from the reports from the administrators. And there's three written reports from Chancellor Juliana Barnes, Irvine Valley College, Dr. John Hernandez, and Saddleback College President Elliot Stern. I'd, I'd advise you to read them because they tell you a lot of interesting, really fascinating stuff about what's going on in the college and, and um, upcoming events. So, D Dr. Barnes, do you have anything additional you'd like to say? Of course. How could I not talk about Biden? I, all I'm going to say <laughs> is love. Yeah, um, that's great. And, that's you exciting. know, again, I just want to add my thanks to President Hernandez for accepting the uh, challenge and opportunity uh, in, in three days flat and to the entire team at, at IVC for making that happen. I know it was a labor of love, and obviously it's just one of the most fabulous things that, that many of us have experienced. But I do want to comment on the fact that, um, and for those of you who were there or you observed it, um, you know, live stream or you read it in the news, you know, I really appreciated the fact that our president acknowledged up front two women that were wearing shirts that said, Free Iran. And I think for those of you who were there, you could hear the chanting outside. There was thousands of people outside uh, peacefully protesting um, in support of, of the people in Iran, in particular the women. And so I do want to acknowledge that, and we do stand in solidarity with the, with the people in Iran to, who are fighting hard for their freedom and just basic, basic rights. And so I wanted to say that. And then again, we talk a lot about DEIA, but what I want to say about that, we, we value truly student access, success, um, and completion. And we can't talk about student access, success, and completion without talking about DEIA. So it's not just, even though it's beautiful, I love, we, we're just finishing up uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. We heard the resolution um, in support of Filipino American History uh, Month. And it's it's beautiful that we celebrate these months, but it's an ongoing value and what I call the watermark of this district, this work. And we do it to, again, really validate student social cultural realities because we know that we need to do that in order for our students to succeed and for us to, to close equity gaps. So I'm just, I continue to be in awe and so proud of this, uh, this community here who supports all of our students. And I'd, I'd, I'd also be remiss to not mention the fact that it is Undocumented Student Action Week and um, uh, both colleges are be doing beautiful work around that. And it, I think you read my notice that went out just in support of our DACA students. Um, that's Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. And these are, st these are our students who come here as children and who are pursuing you know, their, 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 their education. And uh, you know, they are under attack right now. And again, we stand in support of our DACA students and all of our students, regardless of um, immigration status. So I want to say that again, I really appreciate the, the focus in our district focused on uh, DEIA. So thank you. OK, thank you. Thanks so much. And next, Irvine Valley College President Dr. John Hernandez, do you have anything you'd like to say in addition? Well, I won't be speaking about what a wonderful experience <laughs> I, know, I that's had so sad. <laughs> uh, with the president, but I would be remiss that 
I am being thanked and given credit for something that our team at IVC truly were able to execute in a very short turnaround. On Tuesday, I was interrupted in a meeting that we had someone on campus from the White House looking for a location for an event. Um, got on the phone. She came to my office. That afternoon, the Secret Service was there. We identified a location that met their needs. I said, the irony is that I'm flying to Washington, D.C. <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but it truly was all hands on deck. And I know that we've already given thanks to our FMO staff, our police department, marketing and creative services. But I've already thanked them, but I want to publicly thank uh, my executive cabinet, Martha, Rick, David, and Diane. They were just exceptional. Um, I was asked in Washington, D.C. when I was attending uh, the Aspen um, uh, convening, aren't you worried that you're not there? And I said, <laughs> not at all. I have an amazing team. And to me, that is true leadership. And so um, today I actually called the White House um, liaison just because I wanted to follow up and say, we're going to do a debrief. Is there anything that we could have done differently? And she was just beyond thankful for how everyone responded. And, um, you know, that, that, that says a lot. And uh, that evening, um, I, I, I watched the live stream from my hotel room, and I was receiving a lot of selfies and photos <laughs> from a lot of folks, many who are in this room. Um, but the one photo that stood out for me was that um, Dr. Joe Joseph Latham, our director of Veterans Resource Center, mm -hmm. introduced the president to two of our veteran students, and the he president did. gave them a presidential coin. And that photo with those two students just stood out of all the wonderful selfies and wonderful photos. So um, a sincere thanks. And then uh, if, if I just may, I don't want to overshadow the president's visit to acknowledge that our marketing and creative services team was recognized last week at the National Council for Marketing and Public Relations Conference in San Diego. Um, many of you know Ace, uh, Abner Kagigwa who is an excellent photographer, but he oversees all of our marketing and social media platforms. And he received the Rising Star of the Year Award. Wow. And I want to thank Ace and recognize him. And beyond that, the department won three gold medallions, one silver and three bronze. I don't have time to tell you in what categories, but they truly are an exceptional um, team. And I wanted to publicly recognize them. Thank you. That's great. And, and Joe Latham actually took the picture of Trustee Jay and Trustee Me with the President of the United States. And, and then I saw him giving the presidential medals to the students right there. He, he was so wonderful. So it was great. Okay, thank you. Okay, Trustee, okay President Have you Stern. given Dana the name of the White House liaison yet? I have not, but when I heard her president, okay. she's still here. Yeah, um, I, I have that information. All right. I, I saved it on my contacts right away. <laughs> Thank you, President Milchik. Always looking out for you, Dana. I, I do want to pile on. Uh, this was a, a thrill for me as well. I have to say, whenever I go on vacation or to someplace special, I always struggle with the idea of, do you take the time to take pictures or do you force yourself to create the memory for yourself by not taking the picture? In this case, uh, I left the event having an amazing experience with uh, Biden acknowledging me in the middle of a speech when I was smiling and then walking over with intentionality to shake my hand when I was out of reach, but no one got a picture of it as I left that evening. Oh, no. <laughs> but I, but I consoled okay. myself that it was about the moment, and great, great things are sometimes <laughs> ephemeral. You can uh, I woke I, I heard a screenshot the, from the video. I, 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 I you... woke the next morning to find that I was on the POTUS Instagram site. Ah. Uh, so the White House team wow. themselves, the White House photographers, caught it. So the lesson, the moral of this story is <laughs> when you let go, things will come to you. Oh, what a great moral. I, I want to thank um, Chancellor Barnes, uh, President Hernandez, uh, Devit, uh, Diane, and the whole team for inviting me. It was a thrill and an honor, and uh, an honor to be there and, and hear our sister college um, held in such great esteem. Uh, mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge uh, the FAMT division, uh, Scott Farthing, and his amazing uh, film program. Oh, yay. <laughs>
I had the pleasure of attending uh, our student film showcase uh, at the Newport Film Festival on Saturday. Thank you, trustees who attended our other event, so that we could so we could be day. at both. Uh, we'll try to avoid those conflicts. But the the quality of the student films um, really speaks to the the fact that we are developing and have developed a world class film program at Saddleback College, and I'm very proud of that and very proud of the work they did. And finally, I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Vice President Vo Kumamoto, uh, her dean team who sits behind her, and the many faculty and staff who have worked tirelessly. Um, Tram herself has attended 12 listening sessions on our restructuring. Uh, they are doing what is right for students. They are taking broad input to make sure it's done right. And we are working on allocating the programs between these new pathways um, and creating new names for them that will even welcome student input when we get to that point. I want to invite all the trustees and Chancellor Barnes. We will hold a town hall on guided pathways and will at that time talk more about the restructuring and where we end up on November 30th between 2 and 4 p.m. We have, and we'll send you an invite uh, well before then. We have invited Rob Johnstone, who is a, a national researcher and leader in the Guided Pathways Movement and is the state leader of the California Guided Pathways Movement as our guest and a panelist uh, that afternoon. Uh, and he'll be joined by leaders from our own college and Guided Pathways. So we look forward to that event. Thank you again, IBC, for the honor of meeting the president. It was a great moment. Thank you. Very exciting week. Thank you so much. Um, next, um, Vice Chancellor of Business Services, Dr. Anne Marie Gable. Do you have anything? No report? Okay. Uh, Vice Chancellor of Educational Services, Dr. Chris McDonald. I have no report. No report? Okay. And Vice Chancellor of Human Resources, Dr. Cindy Viscochill. No report. No report. Okay. So the meeting is adjourned at 8.43 p.m. Thank you so much. And it was a very, very exciting week. Yeah. <laughs>